Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Farm Talk Breakfast. I'm Christine Gelly, the Extension Educator for Ag and Natural Resources in Noble County, Ohio. And for this morning's topic, we will be covering stockpiling forages for winter feed. We're talking about extending the grazing season and ways to really cut down on those feed costs with the land we already have available to us and how we can be better managers of that land. Our guest speaker today is Chris Penrose. Chris is the Extension Educator in Morgan County, and he uh, also serves in multiple leadership roles in the realm of forages. So Chris, at this point, I'm going to turn the meeting over to you and just let me know when we're ready to advance slides. All right, thank you, Christine. Uh, glad to be here this morning, and um, I think it's probably the appropriate time of the year, and uh, with, with things going on, I think it's also an appropriate talk, at, talk today to talk about uh, ways to try to grow uh, some um, some uh, forages for um, for uh, winter feed. We're basically right now we're looking at a at a two pronged uh, situation going on right now. One is is that uh, we had some freezes on our um, on our hay here uh, late in the spring, and um, and we also got our hay up in a timely fashion, meaning that um, while we had real good real good quality hay, we actually uh, in many situations had very very low yields. And when you couple that with the dry weather that most of us are having right now, um, um, uh, the um, the uh, possibility of having short feed supplies for the winter really is uh, uh, something to uh, to be uh, uh, concerned about right now. So when when um, we go to the next slide here, you know this will kind of emphasize what 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 I'm trying to say because feed feed costs can can account up can account for about 75 percent of the cost of um, of uh, keeping an animal. And um, if uh, there's ways that we can ha actually have the animal graze the forage instead of us harvest it, take it to the barn, and then go back and feed it again, generally speaking, that is a much cheaper option for us. So when we go on the next slide, you know, um, I kind of talk about things that we need to do or can do to become more productive. Uh, of course, better hay management is, uh, is one of them. Management intensive grazing is another option. Good pasture management, such as controlling weeds and maybe adding some fertilizer, is an option, and, extend, and, and extending the uh, grazing season an option too. Uh, you know, one thing I didn't mention in this presentation because it's something that came up uh, rather rather recently is with the short hay supplies that many of us had with the first cutting. Another option that we have, and it can still work right now, is to. Um, is uh, fertilizing some of our uh, hay fields and some of our pasture fields uh, just to try to uh, in, improve some of the yields. Um, back there in early June, after I got first cutting off, I went out and and, um, and uh, spread fertilizer on my hay fields to uh, try to bump up yields, um, and it and uh, we definitely have had a response. The unfortunate thing is, since early June, we've only had about two inches of uh, rain. And uh, it hasn't been able to maximize its uh, potential yet, even though we're out putting up some second cutting hay right now. So that certainly is an option. Uh, when we go to the next slide, um, you know, we I kind of want to talk about what are all of our options, um, you know, and and probably um, from the cheapest to the most expensive, and maybe not because it's just going to depend on on everybody's situation. But you know, typically speaking, stockpiling existing forages. Is a uh, is a cheap, economical, uh, and not a time-consuming uh, endeavor uh, to um, to try to uh, um, produce some some more forages. And the the uh, one thing that I did not mention here is uh, another great option if you have the ability is after corn is harvested, um, if you have some animals out that are in good condition for them to go out and um, and graze on some of the uh, corn stalks, some of the uh, um, some of the uh, corn that or some of the grain corn that has uh, fallen down to the soil and the leaves, stalks, stems, cobs, all of that they can they can graze on. That's a, definitely a, a a good option. You know, and we can't over overlook, you know, um you know, harvesting hay, maybe even purchasing some. You know, the uh the upside to purchasing hay is it doesn't make much time. The downside is is uh, you don't typically know what you're getting. You can import some um some weeds but that certainly is an option. Brassicas is another one that I'll talk about later on. Annual grains such as cereal rye um, and uh, and oats is an option. And of course, we can we can adjust the uh, the herd size. You know, one thing that um, I've heard um, 
um, a lot of our specialists talk about over the years is uh, this may become a good time to try to get rid of some of the bottom 10, 10% of your herd or your flock. So uh, that certainly is an option as well. When we look at the next slide, our goal is to try to graze all year. You know, that's our goal. Most years we can't um, um, accomplish that, but these two slides here are a couple farms in Morgan County. Back in 2012, we were actually into February, and these farmers really hadn't fed any hay at all in the winter, uh, so, so they were actually um, uh, being very successful at it. You know, after the fact, they did end up feeding a little bit of hay, but, um, but certainly uh, they, they uh, really minimized that. Um, and when we go to the next slide, typically the number one um, forage that we try to stockpile is, um, is fescue. You know, fescue is that grass that we um, hate to love or love to hate. You know, going into a drought situation like we're heading into now, fescue typically will stay green longer than, than any of our other grasses. It very much is, a, you know, with the endophyte that, that's in it, um, it, um, it makes it more drought resistant. It's a nitrogen scavenger. You know, the downside to it right now is, it, is the endophyte levels are probably at the highest of the year. So if we do graze it, we want to be cautious about that. Um, typically speaking, once we remove the stems and the seed heads, the endophyte tends to concentrate at the base of the plant. So managing it right now, uh, you would want to have the stems and seed heads removed on it, and then you don't want to graze it uh, um, too close. So as we go to the next slide, uh, Christine, you know, some of the disadvantages of the fescue is those animal health problems that we typically see this time of year. It does spread. Uh, but it does stockpile. Uh, that's one of the definite um, advantages um, um, to that. We do have endophyte-free cultivars out there. We have the novel endophyte fescues out there like Max-Q fescue. So if you are doing a renovation of a field, something like the novel endophytes is an excellent option for us. But if we're just managing what we have, uh, we need to be aware of, um, of some of the disadvantages. But we can, we, can, we can minimize some of the issues grazing it right now i.e. making sure we have the um, stems and seed heads cut off and not grazing it too close. As we go to the next slide, um, I talk about some of the advantages of, um, of uh, stockpiling right now. Uh, typically, we can, um, we can uh, stockpile and, um, and uh, feed that, that later on in the fall or actually in the winter. And let me even back up just a second so, everybody, so we make sure that everybody knows what stockpiling is. Basically, uh, we, we actually make our last uh, clip, hay harvest, or grazing of, um, of a field some, sometime in the summer and, um, and then just set it aside and, uh, and let it grow. Typically speaking, if we add a little bit of nitrogen to it, uh, it will increase the yield. It can increase the quality depending on when we graze it. So there are some um, advantages uh, to that. Fescue seems to be the one for forage or grass that grows at lower temperatures better than any of the other cool season grasses. And it can keep its color and forage quality longer through the winter compared to other forages like orchard grass. We have done some studies stockpiling orchard grass and fescue, and, and uh, that coupled with um, my 40 years of, um, of, um, of um, raising cattle and, um, and growing forages. You know, orchard grass will typically stick around till Christmas time, maybe to, to New Year's before it really starts breaking down. So orchard grass can be stockpiled um, to graze later on, but I would tend to graze that first. If I could graze that in November, maybe in early December, I would do that before I would, um, I would uh, graze any of the fescues. Um, so one of our decisions when we go to stockpile is when do we start and uh, do we fertilize or not? So if we go to the next slide, um, we can kind of look at some of the um, effects on stockpiled yields. Um, we actually, um, 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 if you look at that uh, graph there, you can look at the bottom of the application dates um, back on August 20th, and then on September 24th, um, when we applied nitrogen um, on the, on the uh, bar with the diagonal lines, that's when we added 46 pounds of nitrogen per acre or 100 pounds of urea, and then the 92 pounds of nitrogen an acre was uh, 200 pounds of urea per acre. And um, the uh, one thing that we see here, and it's been pretty consistent over, over my career, just some basic principles here, is that the earlier that we start stockpiling, the more growth we'll have, but the lower the quality. 
the later we start stockpiling, um, the lower the uh, quantity, but the greater the quality. So that's just kind of a, a, a basic principle. But again, on that graph, you can see the, uh, the response on nitrogen. From when we added no nitrogen, there was 2,290 pounds of, um, of, um, of uh, fescue there. And then um, if we added the 50 pounds of, um, of um, I'm sorry, the 46 pounds of nitrogen per acre or the 100 pounds of urea, we get 3,700 pounds. So there's about a 1,500-pound bump there. But if we doubled the rate, you could see the response wasn't, wasn't nearly as much. So over the years, we've kind of concluded that probably around 100 pounds of urea per acre is one of the best options for us. So on the next slide... I kind of talk here a little bit about um, uh, quality, and uh, you can kind of compare the uh, quality of fescue from the spring to the summer to the fall. Uh, you can see actually in the fall how the sugar content is actually um, much higher than the rest of the year. So after a couple freezes, fescue tends to, um, the endophyte levels tend to drop, the sugar levels increase, and it actually becomes a very palatable grass for our animals to, to uh, graze. You can also look at the uh, protein content, how it kind of stays up over the uh, winter months as, as high as 19%. The lowest that I've ever seen fescue when um, we've done testing over my career is about 6.6, .6, uh, around 6% 6 crude, crude protein when we uh, did some sampling in late February um, of the uh, year. So, um, you know, even, even under the worst case scenario, there still is, um, a little bit of quality there. Animals may need supplemented and depending on their body condition, you know, it definitely is a, um, a viable option. So on the next slide, um, I'm going to kind of reemphasize about, um, uh, quality and about when we, uh, actually start, um, um, stockpiling. So if you look at that, uh, first column, you'll see the July 1st date and the August 16th date. And, and, and uh, if you look at the second column, you'll see how we actually had higher yields um, from the July 1st stockpiling versus the August 16th. And these, were, these measurements were taken on November 3rd. And then you can also look at the crude protein content all the way across from that July 1 um, uh, initiation of stockpiling you'll see crude protein went from almost 14%, then in December down to 10, and in February 9.6%. But when we started later, you'll see we had the lower yields and the higher quality all the way across. And on the next slide, we actually started stockpiling even later in the season on August 20th and then September 24th. And you'll see all the way across how the quality was higher when we started later. So just the basic principles once again, and to uh, reinforce what I said, the earlier you start stockpiling, the higher the yields, the lower the quality, and the opposite is true. The later we start, the higher the quality and the lower the yields. Okay, so on the next slide, you know, some of the consideration, like I've already mentioned, the date stockpiling start is a compromise between quality and quantity. We do know for sure in all of the studies that we've done over the years that we can say with uh, pretty much certainty that when you add nitrogen, you will increase your yields. Now, we have to decide if it's, if it's financially viable, you know, the cost of the nitrogen versus, versus the added yields. You know, could you purchase hay or higher, um, a higher amount of hay than what the uh, nitrogen is, is going to cost? And then also the, the amount of time and spreading out your time. Do you have more time, maybe in July or August, to spread urea? And will that take less time than feeding extra hay in, um, in November or December? So everybody's situation is different. So you just kind of need to figure it out what's going to be the, um, the, uh, the uh, best option for you. And other things to uh, consider is, is how much rain are we going to get? What is the forage utilization going, going, going to be? on how you feed the stockpiled forages, how you feed the hay. Um, and then, uh, you know, definitely some of the benefits, and I think I've got a slide towards the end about stockpiling, is, um, is um, some of the reduced feeding costs and some better manure distribution um, when you're um, out on stockpiled feeds versus just feeding hay, especially in one location. So on the next slide, um, again, I'm just talking about um, – when you add that 50 pounds of nitrogen, it's going to increase your quality and yield. Um, 
And then again, when you start stockpiling, can influence yield, yield and quality. And I tell you, the best way to feed some of this stuff is if, if you have an electric fence and only give them a certain amount, um, a certain amount every every day or two, that'll greatly improve their um, their utilization. And one thing I've seen a lot of folks do, or not a lot, but a, at least a few folks do, is um, placing those rain those uh, round round bills out at least 20 feet apart and stockpiling, and then and then moving electric fence in the winter months when you already have those round bales out. Um, the amount of time that you save and the um, and the amount of um, mud issues that you reduce is um, is really amazing. So maybe spacing uh, round 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 bales out in the field and then uh, stockpiling and then moving electric fence during the winter months is a great great option for us out there. Okay, on our next slide. Uh, the next slide, I'm actually showing one of my um, one of my um, pasture fields and hay fields, or or one of my paddock, uh, paddocks. Um, another option on the other end, or in the spring, is um, is actually um, doing some early grazing. Um, I have several hay fields that 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 I will uh, put into my pasture rotation early in the season. This here is a late May. Uh, picture of one of my hay fields. You can actually see the multiflower rose there in um, bloom on the right-hand side. Um, I actually had grazed this two or three times, and then and then I uh, I uh, took it out and let it and let it grow for um, hay production. This is one that you really got to watch close. I actually uh, put cattle in for just a day or so in late March. Did a real fast uh, rotations, and I got them through there a couple times. Um, Christine, you are one slide ahead of me. Um, I'm actually showing the um, the uh, one the one slide right now of the uh, green hay field, um, but um, you can actually go out and do some early grazing of hay fields in March and April. I typically like to get those animals out of there before the grass starts going into uh, its boot stage. I'll get them out of there. It'll it'll actually set the hay field back um, a couple weeks. It'll improve the quality. I've had real good luck with that over the year. I typically think I get about 80% of the yields that that I would if I didn't graze it. I typically try to get them out of there by uh, mid-April, and um, so I can graze it um, a couple times, maybe some some years uh, three times. One of the downsides, and this year was was an example of it, is um, if you're able to get out and start mowing hay fields early in the season, and we don't get a lot of rain, yields could be knocked back. Um, um, uh, quite a bit more, but typically I have pretty good luck. And this, and the field like this one, I tend to wait and harvest it last. Um, and um, right now, that same field, we're ready to make a second cutting off of it. And then I can determine if I want to put it in a pasture rotation, if I want to stockpile it, or if I want to hold it for a uh, third, third, third cutting. So we still have lots of options available. Okay, so. I'm talking about grazing a little bit early in the spring. On the next slide, I'm actually looking at a field. This is a uh, March 3rd field here where I actually um, um, take several cuttings of hay off of it. Actually, right now as I speak, my son is out mowing this exact field down for a second cutting hay. We had cattle out on this field till the end of April. This is a field that's high and dry on my farm, so I'll start stockpiling it um, in the late summer and let it grow throughout the winter. And then in March, I'll turn my cattle out on there, and this is where they will calve at. And, um, and typically speaking, in early March, I'll turn them out on there, and I will not feed any more hay to these cattle for the rest of the winter. So I've had real good luck over the years. I haven't had any mud issues, so I have reduced issues with, um, with calving. It's a real good type of uh, situation. So early grazing is a uh, is a great option as 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 well. So right now we've uh, we did um, we took the cattle off this field here in late March. Um, we let it grow. We um, we mowed it for hay back in June, and right now my son is uh, making a second cutting off of it, and then we'll decide here if we take a third cutting off of it or just let it stockpile now. 
Uh, we'll wait and see what the situations, how the situations um, evolve over over the rest of the summer. Okay. So on the next slide, you'll see a close-up picture here of it. This is on March 3rd. You can actually see some uh, green grass there. Uh, makes it really, really nice for the uh, cattle to graze. If you look up close there, uh, there's some pretty, some pretty decent forage for them. And then on the next slide, you'll see an aerial view of that same field, and you can see some pretty decent manure distribution out there where, where we've had the cattle out there to, um, to uh, graze that stockpiled forage during the month of March. And if you look close there, you'll see our um, our UTV tracks where we go around and try to find where cows are having calves at as as well. So I just I just thought that was an interesting aerial view of that of of that same paddock. Okay, so over the years we've done a lot of work, and and the uh, next slide here we'll start um, we'll start uh, kind of kind of going going through all of this stuff about stockpile and fescue. Um, um, and, and there are some um, products that we can use on urea, some of these urea in, inhibitors that can be used uh, because we know that urea can volatilize and adding some of these urea inhibitors such as agrotane um, can um, reduce the amount of volatile, volatilization that, that um, uh, goes out there. And uh, we started looking at some stuff all the way back in 2013 and, and see what type of response um, we get when we um, uh, uh, fertilize with urea and then maybe add some agritane to the uh, mix as well. So uh, you can kind of look at some of these results. This was just a one-site study for one year. Um, we, uh, we actually went for an extended period of time, about 17 days after we applied the urea till, uh, till we had rain. And, um, and then when we sampled this, uh, this field in uh, October, uh, we had about a ton of dry matter per acre when we did nothing but set these um, these plots aside. When we added urea, um, we had almost a thousand additional pounds, and then when we added urea plus agrotane, we had almost another thousand pounds or or four thousand pounds of dry matter. So what ended up happening? And if we move to the next slide, um, we ended up doing a, a multi-year, multi-site uh, study trying to uh, look at look at look at um, what are some of the best ways to stockpile. So what we did for three years at three sites, the sites were in Monroe, Morgan, and Noble Counties. Um, uh, we actually um, did some replicated uh, plot work at, at all three of those counties, and um, we basically had a control, which we did nothing. We um, had a situation, um, a, um, a set of um, plots where we um, added um, 46 pounds of nitrogen per acre or 100 pounds urea. We did the 100 pounds of urea plus agritane at the um, recommended rate, and we also did 46 pounds of nitrogen in the form of ammonium sulfate to see kind of which ones worked best. And I'll just tell you right now, the bottom line with all the studies, all the replicated research that we've done, the bottom line, the only thing that we can say stat with statistical significance is, is that when you add nitrogen, you improve yields. That's basically the um, the uh, take take home point to it. Um, occasionally, we would see better yields with um, with agrotane, but it wasn't statistically significant. We would see better quality um, at times with added nitrogen, but it wasn't statistically significant. So, uh, but we can say with confidence that added nitrogen improves yields. Um, so, when we when we look at the results um, on the next slide on the 2015 orchard grass study. Typically speaking, we would start initiating uh, the uh, study around the 1st of August. We would harvest the plots around the 1st of November um, when, we, when we look at the results of that. Um, you'll see in that first year when we did the orchard grass, um, you would see a response with urea of about 269 pounds, urea and agritane 511, and urea with Nutrisphere only 282 pounds, um, so so you can see the differences there. You'll tend to see maybe you know here you didn't really see a a, a large response with crude 
crude protein in this study. So this was orchard grass. And, again, if we're going to feed orchard grass um, stockpiled, I would recommend to, uh, to, to, to graze that probably by the end of November, the end of Christmas, or the end of December at the very latest. So the next slide, some thoughts with orchard grass is it doesn't persist as well as fescue in cold weather. Crude protein increases somewhat with urea. Um, yields increase with urea more than when a, um, um, when a urease inhibitor is added. I think there's some variation there. Um, ammonium sulfate works well, but it tends to be more expensive. So, um, but if you add some nitrogen, um, I think you'll, uh, you'll, uh, you'll get improved yields. And while I'm talking about it, you know, reading some other studies with urea, adding urea, is I think we're learning that when we add urea uh, for stockpiling, the volatilization of urea is not as bad as what we thought. Typically speaking, in some research that I've read, um, you may not typically – when it's dry, you won't lose more than 20% of your, your, your urea. So um, maybe in extreme situations, 40%, but typically what I've been seeing and reading is you won't lose more than 20%. If you do add urea on, only, and it was an interesting recommendation, is wait till the ground is dry. Don't put it on when there's a lot of dew on the ground because it will start um, breaking down um, at that point. So. Um, that's that's a um, that's an important issue there to um, to try to think about. So um, so with that um, we'll move on to the uh, to our next slide. There we go. Okay. Um, in our next year, we start looking at some of the results of um, of uh, stockpiling, and you'll start seeing some. Um, some things uh, uh, come out here. In, in terms of dry matter per acre, um, our control had about 2,700 pounds of dry matter per acre, urea 3,100 pounds. Urea with agritane had almost 3,700 pounds. And this year in that study, in 2016, the, the urea with agritane was statistically significant difference in terms of yield over um, urea and um, the control and ammonium sulfate. In other years, we didn't see that as as much. Now, if you look at the crude crude protein, you'll see that it was a little bit higher with ure with uh, adding adding nitrogen, but it was very very small. On our next slide, on our next slide here. You'll just see a picture of our 2017 plots. This is actually that same field that I showed you earlier where, where um, um, my cows are out um, having their calves. And uh, when we're grazing the stockpile in, um, in um, March, and this is an August picture here where we're taking off some second cutting hay, um, getting ready to stockpile that to graze in the month of March. So just an actual field where where we had those plots in 2017. That's in Morgan County there, and we had identical plots in Monroe and Noble County. 2018, on the next slide, we'll take a look here at some of the results. And once again, if you look at how many pounds um, above the control we had when we added urea, urea of agritane, and ammonium sulfate, you'll see that um, when we added urea, we had 620 pounds. Uh, more than the control, or almost a ton and a half per acre. With the urea and agritane, we'll see it was a little bit higher, but it wasn't statistically significant. And then the ammonium nitrate uh, was there somewhere in between. And again, if you look there, you'll see that crude protein was a tick higher than doing nothing at all, but it was not statistically significant. So putting it all together on the next slide, you know, just some thoughts here. Um, um, if fescue is an issue on your farm, we want to use it to our advantage. Um, and um, if, um, if uh, your pastures are predominantly endophyte infected, uh, then I would really graze them hard during, during the, uh, the, uh, the uh, winter months. Um, and then um, if you have some exposed soil, 
in February, maybe doing some frost seeding. It's a great option for you. Um, if you need to be grazing it now, don't graze it too close. Make sure that it's been mowed to get the stem and seed heads off of it. Um, um, you can increase stocking de density by dividing pasture into smalling, smaller paddocks, rotating more often. Again, adding legumes to the pasture by maybe uh, frost seeding, and then maybe stockpile then for uh, winter winter grazing. You can actually, if you need to, feed hay late in the summer, and then um, um, you can feed the um, the stockpile in the later months. So on the next slide. If you have infected fescue pastures, you can consider renovation of some paddocks. If your topography uh, permits, uh, maybe replace it with endophyte free or a novel endophyte fescue. I really like those novel endophytes. And, um, and uh, maybe some other cool season species if possible. Maybe even a summer annual would be something that could be planted. Um, it's starting to get late to do that, but some, some people will do that in late June. Doing something like a sword in Sudan grass could 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 be an option for you as well. So, on the next slide, I throw this one in. It's a palatability study that we did years ago, but I think it's still relevant today about what do animals like to graze on. Um, and um, and if you look at that um, um, column over on the left or the uh, bar all the way over on the uh, left. That is kind of one, that's, that's kind of the control that we use with this study. That's benchmark orchard grass. And if you look at that slide, um, you'll look at some other um, um, grasses as we go across there. Uh, Jess is a Jessup endophyte free fescue. Then there's Fawn, which is an endophyte free, Barcel, AU Triumph, um, Festalina, Star Grazer. Those are all endophyte free fescues. Then there's the Kentucky 31 fescue, and then Kentucky 31 with clover, endophyte-free Kentucky 31. Martin is an endophyte-free fescue. And this Jessup Plus actually was the uh, grass that was used that ultimately became Max-Q fescue. So when you look at that, just kind of to give you some idea, if the cattle, these uh, cattle will actually turn out on these plots and for, for a couple days, and they got to graze what they wanted. Actually, they were put on those plots for, for seven days. They could graze what they want. After two days, um, they really went after the orchard grass. And, um, and then um, they started grazing some of the other stuff. But if you, if you take a look at those, uh, you'll see that, um, that typically speaking, they don't like the endophyte-infected fescues. Um, and they, 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 um, they basically would rather graze graze on the um, on the orchard grass so and the, basically with this slide too is once they got down to uh, uh, once they graze about 40 percent you know they were actually down to just a couple inches from the uh, from the ground so that's without really pushing them hard that's about as as much as they graze so um, just kind of an interesting slide there all right on the next slide just uh, again on the summary of uh, fescue management it can be a high quality grass. Um, some of those newer endophyte infected soft leaf varieties have excellent palatability, like in the previous slide. Uh, that fawn was a, a pretty um, uh, nice grass that the um, cattle would graze. They didn't like it as much as the orchard grass, but they liked it better than some of the other, some of the other fescues. Um, again, you know, endophyte fescue is a management challenge just because of its reduced palatability, and that will reduce animal performance. But there are things we can do to kind of reduce that. Okay, on the next slide is just a, um, a, a picture of, um, of a uh, stockpiled field. This is actually a field over in Missouri where it's been stockpiled. And if any of you can remember that, that was Jim Barrett, the, um, the ag agent that we had over in uh, Washington County. Well, we were actually over in uh, Missouri uh, at a meeting with Jim Garrish, and uh, he was showing some real nice stockpiled uh, fescue over there. Okay, so some of our conclusions um, on this with the next slide is that stockpiling cool season grasses, especially fescue, will reduce the need for stored uh, forages. And in many cases, it's higher quality than the hay we make. Again, we kind of recommend that 50 pounds of nitrogen per acre or 100 pounds urea, which is 46 pounds, but somewhere in there. 
I still, if I needed to and I saw it was going to be dry, I still would probably use something like some Agritain, um, even though in our studies it didn't show uh, significant differences. Uh, you know, for all the effort that we're putting in, if it helps a little bit, maybe it's a good option for us. If you have orchard grass and fescue both um, and stockpile on it, I would um, feed the stockpiled orchard grass first. And again, we need to look at what the costs are and also the time involved and when we are going to be uh, using the time, uh, whether it's um, um, adding fertilizer in August or feeding extra hay later on in the winter. Um, so next slide. If we look at the next slide, I can't resist this. Um, if some of you can ever remember the old Alice Chalmers small round, round balers, we still have a farmer in Morgan County. Um, that stockpiles some uh, fields. He'll he'll take the one cutting off with these small round bales, with the old Alice Chalmers balers, and then um, uh, let the field stockpile. This was actually taken on February 6th, and then on the next slide, just one week later, uh, when the snow melted, you could actually see those round bales there, and that one bale in the foreground. Hopefully, we get that slide up here, Christine. That next slide. It's there for me. Is it popping up? But it may, may still be go. lagging for you. Yeah. If you look at that bale up close, we actually peeled back just a little bit of hay. The quality on those round bales really stayed up good. But you can also look close and see some green stockpiled fescue there. And then um, basically this farmer was ready to go out with electric fence and um, and do some strip grazing, and the cattle would have the choice of the bales or the stockpiled forages. And in many situations, uh, cattle would go after the stockpiled grass before they uh, actually went after the uh, round round bales of hay. And for those of you that may know him, over um, on the uh, Noble Morgan County border, this is some of uh, Bob Deese fields um, where he would uh, do some stockpiling. And then on the next slide, this is another farmer here in Morgan County that would stockpile, and he had a new idea round, round, round baler that would bale about four to 600 pound round, round bales. He would turn the cattle out. Um, this is a stockpiled field you'll see here in the middle of January. He had the round bales and the stockpiled forages, and um, that's kind of how he did that. On the next slide, this here is on my farm, one of my hay fields. If you recall that one field, that one slide that I showed that had the uh, barbed wire on it and the mature grass, um, that this field here is that same field where I actually grazed it twice um, in March and early April, took a cutting or two of hay off of it, maybe put it in the pasture rotation once or twice, then I set it aside and stockpiled it, and then this here is in November when I turned the cattle out on it to uh, to graze it. So. You know, trying to stay flexible, whether we need to take more hay off, put in a pasture rotation or stockpile, it's going to depend on everybody's um, situation. So that's kind of it with, um, with stockpile and fescue and orchard grass. I do want to talk about some other options. Um, and on the next slide, um, you'll see a picture here of a bunch of brassicas growing over in New Zealand. Um, farmers over in New Zealand actually would um, – would, um, have a 10-year rotation with a lot of their their pastures. They believe that that um, that the uh, genetics and and um, and uh, seed varieties improved so much that it warranted doing a reseeding every 10 years or so of their um, grass and uh, legumes. And then for two years they would put brassicas into the rotation, um, and then uh, they would they would use this to uh, to graze uh, during their um, their winter months. So on the next slide. I want to talk about brassicas, uh, and, and the most common brassica out there is turnips. Turnips is, um, is a great option, especially in late summer to grow extra feed fast. It's also an option to plant early in the spring for early summer growth. Just a couple thoughts on brassicas. I, I may be talking about it later on, but when I think about it, I better talk about it. Um, in studies that we've done over the years, um, we've used a lot of different varieties. There are forage varieties of turnips out there um, that are that are excellent options. Um, purple top turnips also work just fine. Those are the turnips that you can buy at the garden center, 
and you only need a couple pounds per acre. So you think about a couple pounds per acre, you need about 50 pounds of nitrogen. If your phosphorus and potassium levels are at minimally acceptable levels, uh, turnips certainly can be an option for you. Uh, typically, I like to see them uh, planted here in East Central and Southeast Ohio around the 25th of July. You'll get maximum quality in about 60 days. You'll get maximum quantity in about 90 days. Another thought or two on brassicas is that when it turns cold, um, they can go down here really fast. So you want to graze them typically before temperatures get below 20 degrees. Um, if they get uh, if it gets below 20 degrees, it'll kill the tops. If it gets below 15 degrees, it'll kill the um, the um, the uh, bulbs. But you can get about 10,000. If everything goes right, you can get about 10,000 pounds of dry matter in about 90 days. So um, what you can get is a uh, is amazing. So if you're short right now on stuff for the winter, turnips may be an option for you. Many years that we've done it, we've had good success. There's been a I can I can recall one year where it was very dry. We never got rain. We didn't have very good yields on them. But just from a farmer's perspective, if you can get those things established and you can get them started, um, they they will they will typically go. So if if they get a little bit of rain off of them after you plant them, they'll do uh, really really well. So the next slide, I've kind of already talked about this. These are high quality, high yielding, fast growing, relatively low cost. Um, um, you know, typically speaking, the uh, leaves will be eight, 16 to 18 percent protein. The bulbs will be 8 to 10 percent protein. Uh, they are low in fiber, um, and I'll talk a little bit more about that later, some things that we can do with it. So on the next slide, um, and I talk about the disadvantages. It does cost more. It takes more time than, than stockpiling. It is dependent on that timely rain to get established. Um, if they bolt, and set seed. Uh, that's typically uh, not desirable for the animals. Uh, we typically don't see that in the fall. You can see it if you plant them in the early spring. They are easy to establish. You know, the two options are no-till, maybe with a herbicide and a no-till drill. So on the next slide, um, we kind of talk about some of those options. Um, if we do it no-till, again, we can do it with a herbicide and a no-till drill. Um, We've had some farmers try doing it with some close grazing. Um, it's more liable, liable to be successful with sheep. Um, it's not going to be as successful with um, with cattle. So on the next slide, Christine, I'm talking a little bit about ways that they're easy to establish. Uh, there we go. So no-till is typically the best. Conventional tillage will work. I'll tell you on an old, on a personal situation that I did once on my farm, uh, I went out and dissed a hay field. Um, got about a 60% kill. It was primarily an orchard grass field. Then I um, I went out and uh, after I uh, tilled it, I actually threw on some triple 19 fertilizer um, because um, my soils were so poor. Um, but I got on the equivalent of 50 pounds of nitrogen per acre. And then um, I went over with a cultivar packer and cultivar packed it. Then I broadcasted it by hand, and then went back and um, and cultivar packed it again. I talked about um, only two to four pounds per acre of uh, turnip seed is all you need. Um, if you're going to broadcast it at two pound rate, you about have to mix it with fertilizer um, because uh, it's almost impossible to get that seeding rate that low. Uh, so if you mix it with fertilizer, um, you can get a better distribution. Just keep in mind that granule fertilizer will spread out more than the seed. So I would have to rate and overlap by 50%. If you do use a no-till drill, um, the no-till drill that we used on several occasions, the smallest, the lowest rate we could get on the drill was about four pounds per acre. Uh, when we tried to get it lower, we'd start crushing the seed. So uh, we did that and had some pretty good luck with that. The other advantage to no-till, especially if you have cattle, is um, you're not going to tear up the ground as much because you maintain that sod. Uh, so when you graze it later on in the fall, especially if it gets wet, um, you're not going to tear things up nearly as bad. Okay. And here you'll, on the um, on the next slide, you'll see what it looks like when you no-tilled it in. You keep that sod cover there, and the um, and uh, you end up tearing the ground a whole lot less. On the next slide, I've already talked about 
Uh, this that maximum quality is in 60 days, maximum yield in 90 days. Um, Premier kale, that's another brassica. Um, our my friends at the farmers market are selling that for people to eat, but cattle really like it too, and sheep and goats. Uh, that'll actually stay hardy well below zero degrees. So um, it's a slower growing. It doesn't yield as 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 much, but that's an option. Um, there's some Swedes out there. We've grown some mustards and some other stuff, um, but typically turnips is what does best. On the next slide, you'll see a picture of Chris back when he had a bunch of hair, and you'll actually see one of these forge-type turnips. This one was actually called Rondo, um, and um, you'll see actually how big that turnip was. So, you know, you could get some real good yields with some of those forge forge growing turnips. But again, um, you can get pretty good response from just our good old-fashioned purple top turnips as well. If you look at the next slide, you'll actually see what I'm talking about here with the yields in some studies that, um, that, um, that we've done, um, uh, some of the, in some studies that we did, um, you'll look down at the purple top turnip is the third one from the bottom. We had about 7,000 pounds of yield on that. And then the next one above it is that Rondo turnip that I just showed. It produced about five tons uh, per acre of uh, dry matter. Uh, some of our other uh, farmers that have gone out and done this over the years, they have gotten up to five tons of dry matter with the purple top turnip as, as well. So certainly some options out there. On the next slide, talk about that winter hardiest, uh, which ones did best when it got really cold. Um, the one thing that I wanted to... Uh, to note is that premier kale survived um, the entire winter. Um, but most things, after it warmed up, after it got really cold, um, would end up rotting and, um, and molding. So, um, so typically speaking, if we can graze those things, you know, probably by Thanksgiving or a little bit before, I think that's going to be the best option for us. On the next slide, um, I'm trying to think of the uh, think of our friend over in uh, Monroe County, Bob Allman. This is actually at his farm where he was growing some cereal rye, uh, some turnips, and actually had some stockpiled fescue for his cattle. You'll see over on the right-hand side where he kept that electric fence up high so the cattle could stick their heads underneath and eat those turnips. It was almost like moving a bunk every day. He had real good utilization for that. And I mentioned earlier that turnips tend to be low in fiber, so if we want them to utilize it better, those that um, that um, those uh, brassicas, if we feed some old or some very mature hay, or put them on, or have give them some access to some stockpiled fescue or some stockpiled grasses that's high in fiber, um, that's that's a real good option. So if the cattle eat the turnips only, they'll have extremely loose stools. But if we feed them some uh, stockpiled forages or some mature hay, that'll slow it down and improve our utilization. Uh, so here, Bob actually had the turnips, cereal rye, and stockpiled fescue all separate. But on the next slide, we, and in in this slide here, this farmer here was growing some cereal rye and turnips on the left-hand side, and then had some stockpiled forages on the right hand side. So he was actually feeding some stockers here on on this slide with the stock pot, with the um, uh, turnips and cereal rye on the left hand side and the uh, uh, stockpiled fescue on the right and then he would have some electric fence going crossways so those calves would have the choice of either one. On the next slide you'll see here a mixture of cereal rye and turnips with the stockers on there as well. So lots of different options for us. So, Christine, you can move to the next slide. Are we on cautions when the grazing brassicas? Okay, that's good. We're there. Okay. It's on my computer where stuff are going going bad. So cautions when using brassicas. I've mentioned that low fiber fiber levels. Um, additional um, roughage will help. High nitrate levels are possible. 
so don't apply too high rates of nitrogen or potassium. There can be some toxic compounds to flowering, so use prior to spring. And it could flavor milk. So any, if we have any dairy farmers out there, um, this is probably something to um, avoid. The old recommendation was to remove cattle two hours prior to milking. If I have lactating dairy cows, I probably wouldn't graze this. On the next slide, for our friends that raise sheep and goats, this is a slide here of, um, of one of our f farmers down in Athens County that actually planted turnips here in this field. He had a sheep graze it. The sheep act after, after the sheep grazed the areas, he would go out and spread some cereal rye. And then actually that next summer, that cereal rye came on very strong. He actually took that field off for, a, um, for cutting the hay that was cereal rye. On the next slide, we kind of start getting into, you know, things to mix and match. You know, you think about, think about corn stalks, you think about turnips, you think about cereal rye or oats, you think about stockpiling fescue, you know, we can, we can do a mix or match of these depending on your situation. This farmer over in Illinois on some real good, real good corn and uh, bean ground actually went out and, um, and uh, had a uh, plane fly on three pounds of acres, I mean three pounds of turnips per acre and two pounds of rye while the corn was still standing. And then um, after the corn was harvested, the rye and turnips came up, and he had a real good mixture then of, um, of corn stalks, um, cereal rye, and turnips. On the next slide, here's another picture of turnips and spring oats. This was in November that was put out for, for grazing. So just an option there. The next slide, the next slide when we look at it in March of the corn stalks and turnips and oats, you can see this one was pretty well grazed down. Again, these pictures were taken over in central Illinois. You can see those two cows grazing out on the corn stalks. They're in real good condition as well. Then on the next slide, we're looking at some cereal rye in November of 1999, and then again that same field in March. Cereal rye, the advantage of cereal rye is, is it's going to be the first thing that greens up in March. So that, that makes it an option. Um, if you plant it in September, you could do a light grazing in December and then go back again in March and graze it. One of the things that I've seen that's an issue for us here in eastern Ohio is if you're going to be growing cereal rye or you're going to be growing turnips and you've got a lot of deer, there could be a lot of wildlife pressure on that. Even my stockpiled fescue that I have to graze in March, um, the past couple of years, by the time I get around to March, uh, the deer may have already grazed about a third of it off. So uh, that's something that we need to be cognizant of as well. On the next slide, you'll see what it's like um, in November grazing some of those turnips and spring oats. You'll see how much yield is out there when you look at those cows. Um, there's, there's just an awful lot of, um, of uh, forage out there for them to graze. And then on the next slide, Christine, you'll actually see some cows out grazing on some turnips. And uh, they they're really enjoy it. You know, cows typically, when grazing turnips, they will actually pull the top and the bulb out and graze the whole thing. Sheep and goats will typically graze the top and then kind of cup out the bulb. Uh, on the next slide, we're kind of looking at a close-up here of some oats in December. Uh, you can see that they're starting to lose color, but it still is a good quality feed. Stan Smith, the Fairfield County Program Assistant, our ag person over there, um, um, has uh, demonstrated that quality really stays good even, even uh, further into the winter. The next slide, I just want to show how the quality can really hold up on this one. Uh, on a forage nutrient um, analysis. Um, in uh, November, you can see that crude protein on turnips and spring oats is at 13%. Um, and then even um, spring oats and cereal rye is at 21%. When we get into December, um, the quality is still good on those. 
And then even in January, the crude protein on the whole turnips and spring oats is still almost 10%. On just turnips and spring oats alone is almost 11%. And then um, spring oats and cereal rye is almost 16%. So definitely quality will stay up on those. Okay. We're starting to put it all together and uh, winding down here. Um, you'll look here on the next slide, just corn stalks and cereal rye. Um, that's, that's, uh, that's left in March. Um, so you'll see some uh, what's, what's kind, kind of left there. That cereal rye will keep on growing and will provide some, um, some uh, uh, dry matter a little bit later on. And then on the next slide, You'll just see that this fits all classes of livestock. You'll see some uh, some uh, dairy steers here grazing on turnips on the next slide. Then on the next slide, deer really like it. And, of course, um, um, some of our uh, deer hunting friends here really like to plant turnips and uh, cereal rye, and, it, and definitely for a reason. On the next slide, you'll see some sheep out grazing on the turnips. They do a real good job with it. And... Um, you know, we want to, um, on the next slide, extend that grazing. Um, well, on the on the next slide, Christine, after uh, we get through all the animals, um, I just want to finish up with uh, with one other option, and that's to extend the grazing season in the summer while stockpiling for the winter. I've kind of touched on this. We have some warm season grasses that we can actually do. Okay, so on the next slide, you'll see me actually – uh, here with some warm season grasses. I know Christine's done some work with that over the years. Uh, this is one of our, f our farmers over in, in Morgan County. In this situation here, if you want to do some grazing, I definitely have the animals out before it gets that tall. But you can see the potential for uh, for some warm 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 season grasses out there. And then there's the annuals. Uh, this is some sorghum su su Sudan grass and some studies that we did over in Noble County um, at the uh, research farm. So those are those are definitely options there for us as well. Okay, and then on the um, on the last slide here's just some uh, aerial pictures of my farm. Just to remind you, uh, when you feed hay. You know, try not to tear up the ground. Try to do the best to uh, distribute the uh, nutrients. Um, on this last slide here, the top right-hand picture is where I have fed some hay. It was on some real poor ground. I'm trying to distribute those nutrients where they will help the most. And in that bottom left-hand picture is that picture I showed you several times of uh, where I early grazed and uh, took off some hay. Uh, that's back in the old uh, picture where um I had that barbed wire and that mature that barbed wire fence and that mature hay field. This is that same field again after I uh, grazed the stockpile in November. Uh, this is an aerial view in March, and you can actually see that um, how how well the nutrients were distributed. So, Christine, with that, um, that's my presentation. If there are any questions, I would be happy to take them at this time. So, thank you very much, everybody. Um, I've enjoyed doing this, and hopefully. It's been helpful to you. And, again, if you have questions, uh, you can contact Christine or you can give me a call um, at the Extension Office in Morgan County. Um, it's 962-4854, area code 740. Or you can email me at penrose.1 at osu.edu. And, of course, Christine has a lot of good information, too, so you can contact her or some of my other colleagues as well. And I know Christine's done some work on warm season grasses, so if you have questions about that, you may give her, her a shot. So, all right, Christine, thank you very much. Thank you so much, Chris, for joining us this morning, and we will make this recording available for other folks to watch later on. And uh, yes, as Chris mentioned, we do have some experience with warm seasons, both perennials and annuals, so if that's something you're thinking about pursuing for your farm, please let us know. We'd be happy to help you get started on developing a management system. And as Chris mentioned, if uh, one of us doesn't know the answer to your question, we'll certainly be able to connect with people who do know. Uh, through our extension network, we have so many people that specialize in such a variety of topics. We'll certainly be able to find someone knowledgeable on the topic you need. 
At this point, I'm going to stop the recording and then we will open it up for additional questions.